today we start a new series uh, for the month of March. So this will be a four week series uh, before we celebrate Easter the first Sunday of April. Today I wanna to talk about questions from Jesus, questions from Jesus. We always have questions for Jesus. We're the ones that always feel like we've got all the questions that we need answers to. Uh, but throughout the Bible and throughout his ministry, Jesus asked lots of questions. And so the next four weeks, we'll explore some of the questions that Jesus asked um, throughout his ministry. And that will be our series, Questions from Jesus. And our first will come from John 5, 5 through 6. John 5, 5 and 6 from the New King James Version. And it says, when Jesus saw him lying there, he knew he had already been in that condition a long time. He said to him, do you want to be made well? Do you want to be made well? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord God, for giving us the opportunity to worship in this manner. We thank you, Lord God, for the, the songs that have been heard and sung, and we thank you uh, for the celebration and the praise and worship that you uh, give us the opportunity to have with one another. And we now, Lord, thank you for your word. Father, we pray, Lord God, that you open our hearts and our ears and our minds to receive what you have prepared for us. Father, I, hum I humble myself to nothingness, that you would be everything in me, and that your word would go forth and perform that which you have purposed it to perform, and that it would not return back void. Father, we bless you, we honor you, we glorify you, and we praise you. In Jesus' precious name, we say amen, amen, and amen. Jesus asks a question in today's a message, and that question is, do you want to be made well? Other translations say, do you want to be healed. Do you want to be healed? Now, in order to really understand the, the, the strength of this question, we've got to understand the entire context of the story. And so if we start at verse one, we see after this, there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate, a pool, which is called in Hebrew, Bethesda, having five porches, in these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease that he had. And that was from the first four verses of John chapter 5. So first, let's kind of walk through the background here before we dig into the man and the question. Jesus goes up to Jerusalem for one of the feasts. John doesn't say which feast it was. Um, I, I feel like if he would consider it uh, of any significance, importance to the, the scope of the story, he would have mentioned it. He doesn't mention it. Talks about the sheep gate. Now, this sheep gate was the, where the sheep entered into the temple complex to be sacrificed. So what we then know is that the location of this sheep gate and the location of this pool was near the temple. And so whatever feast that Jesus was there for uh, was near and around uh, the temple complex. Secondly, the, the, the main setting here is this pool. This pool is called the Pool of Bethesda. Bethesda in Hebrew means house of mercy. Beth, the root word Beth means house, house of mercy. And the, the setting or the structure of this pool, the, the, the Bible says had four porticos or porches. And these, or excuse me, not four, but five, five porticos or large porches. And these porches were set around the, the circumference of the pool. And these were all the invalids sat, right? He, the, the Bible describes them. They were the blind. They were the, the paralyzed. They were the lame, right? Whatever ailment that they had, these five porches were kind of the holding stations for these invalids to sit around the pool. Now, I was reading to you from the New King James translation. If you are reading from a different translation, such as maybe the NIV or the New Living Translation or the English Standard, or whatever it is, you may not have seen 
or read that fourth verse that I read. So I'm starting to read and I say, an angel went down at a certain time into the pool. And you're probably looking at your translation and say, well, I don't see that in my translation. Well, there's a reason for that. Because later translations and many translations do not include verse four in the root or in the main scripture, but instead has a footnote explaining the absence of that verse. Why? Because earlier Greek manuscripts do not contain the language from verse four. It was likely added as a marginal note in later manuscripts and then added as an actual verse in translations such as the King James Version and the New King James Version. And then later translations removed it and replaced it with a footnote. That doesn't mean that the, the text of that note is incorrect. It just means that the earlier translations, the earlier and most dependable manuscripts did not include that text as part of the main narrative. And, but it was necessary to put it in there somehow, either as a verse or as a marginal note, because it, it helps explain a statement the man made later in verse seven, which we'll read. But what he says in verse seven is when the waters bubble up or when the water bubbles up. So then that begs the question, why would the water bubble up? And that this verse four or this marginal note helps explain the bubbling up of the waters, meaning certain, certain periods throughout the year, this angel would come down and stir up the water in this pool of Bethesda. And when that water stirred up, whoever was the first to go into the water was healed. So I hope that, I, I think it's important for us to explain that if you're, if you're reading through the scripture so that we can kind of put some context and some background of that. Now, uh, from an archeological and historical standpoint, the site of this pool of Bethesda was excavated in the 19th century. Uh, up until this point, there was argument about the real existence of this because nobody had found this pool of Bethesda and it was, thought that there was the, the, archeo the archeological concept of a portico was not common in Israel. So it, it left a lot of people arguing that uh, this was not biblically accurate because number one, they couldn't find the site. Number two, uh, there was no archeological commonality of this type of structure. And then when they actually excavated it in the 19th century, they were left with egg in their faces when they found out, oh, they really did build something like this in biblical times. And this ex excavation site can be found now in the Muslim quarter of, of Jerusalem uh, near the Temple Mount, where John says it was, uh, but it's now called at the site of the Church of St. Anne. And it's no longer called the Sheep Gate, but it's called the Lion's Gate uh, it's the, or St. Stephen's Gate. So if you want to do some research, Google or whatever, you can read about uh, the current location of this site. I don't know, I just went down a rabbit hole yesterday reading more and more about this and uh, wanted to share. Now, into our text, John 5, 5 through 6, uh, the scripture reads, Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When John saw him lying there, he knew that he had already been in that condition a long time. He said to him, do you want to be made well? Do you want to be made well? The first thing we see here is an indication of Jesus' knowledge. Jesus' knowledge. Why? Because, first of all, what do we know about Jesus? He's God. He's the Son of God, and he is in his deity, he is God. And as God, Jesus would know everything about this man. But the two categories I want to pull out that Jesus knows about this man is that he knows the facts about this man. He knows that he was paralyzed. He knows that he had been paralyzed for 38 years. And he knows that he had likely been coming to this pool for the majority of those 38 years. So he knows the details about this man's life. But not only does he know the facts about this man, he knows the feelings about this man. He knows that because of the facts, these facts produce feelings. Imagine you being paralyzed for 38 years. 
Imagine that every opportunity that you try to get healed failed. Imagine that. What kind of feelings would that produce in you? So Jesus not only knew the facts of this man, but he knew the feelings of this man. He knew this man had to feel in some point broken. He knew that he had to at some point feel angry and discouraged and depressed. And so in the same way, I want to ask you to reflect on your own life, reflect on your own situation. You may have more to reflect on than others, depending on how long you've lived. You may look at all of the challenges that you've gone through in your life, all of the struggles that you've gone through, and even all of the things that you are going through right now. I want to tell you that Jesus not only knows the facts of those situations, but he knows the feelings. Jesus knows the same about us, and not only does he know the fact of your situation, the facts about your physical condition, the facts about your marital condition, the facts about your financial condition, the facts about your career condition, but he knows that those facts don't stand on themselves on an island, but they produce feelings that make those uh, experience much more emotional. And so he knows the feelings that, and the emotions that these facts can produce. And because of Jesus' infinite knowledge of the facts and feelings of your personal situation, they bring about a, 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 a compassion. Psalm 139, 1 through 4 says, you have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. This gives us a very good understanding about how and why Jesus responds to us the way he does, because he knows so much about us. I mean, have you ever known someone uh, at a distance? And then the more you learn about their situation, the more you learn about their story, the more you learn about their struggle, you became more and more uh, uh, connected and compassionate about it. And now, so imagine Jesus infinitely knowing all about you. Of course, his infinite knowledge, Jesus' knowledge about us produces compassion. And so now I want to know, I want you to know about Jesus' compassion. John 5, 6, and 7 says, when Jesus saw him lying there, he knew that he had already been in that condition for a long time. He said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me in a pool, in the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Listen to the answer. First of all, here's the question. We're talking about questions from Jesus. The question is, do you want to be made well? Do you want to be healed? Of course, he knew that the man wanted to be healed. He knows everything about the man. He knows the facts about his situation. He knows the feelings that those facts produce. So Jesus isn't answering a question, waiting for an answer that he doesn't know. He knows the answer. But he wanted to hear the true declaration of the need. Sometimes many of us ask people questions we already know the answer to, but we want to hear the perspective of the person giving the answer so that we can properly provide the guidance and the response that is going to be the most effective in that person's life. Jesus knows the answer but he wanted the man to articulate it in his own way. He wanted to hear the true declaration of the need and he wanted to hear the acknowledgement of the man's helplessness. And I really appreciate this man not saying just, yes, I want to be healed. Because what the man says tells a story about our own need for salvation. The man's answer was this. It was not a resounding yes, but it was an explanation. He says, there is no man to place me in the pool. And when I try to get in, somebody beats me there. I mean, can you imagine this man's struggle? Man can't help me. And because of my paralyzed state, I can't help myself. Two things 
things he says that describes his helplessness. Man can't help me and I can't help myself. Isn't that the state that we all find ourselves in when we're seeking salvation? Because that is where we are. Man does not have the ability to save us. We don't have the ability to save ourselves. Of course, I want to be healed. Of course, I want to be made well. But nobody around me can do it, and I can't do it myself. An answer such as this produces and enhances the compassion of Jesus because he knows what this man needs. He knows what this man desires, and he knows what this man requires but nobody else can do it but Jesus. Jesus responds with compassion, not because of anything the man did. The man did, couldn't do anything. He was too paralyzed, and he had been paralyzed for such a long time, but he sees and hears the desperate confession of a man who says, I'm helpless. Jesus is the same with us. He has an infinite knowledge of the facts and feelings of our individual situation. And because of his infinite knowledge, it brings about infinite compassion. Because of his complete knowledge, it brings about powerful compassion. And because of that, it produces Jesus' immediate power. His complete knowledge brings about compassion Great compassion, and that great compassion brings about immediate power. John 5, 8 and 9 says, Jesus said unto him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. Now, I can sit here all day and talk about uh, the whole debate about the Sabbath. I just don't have the time. Uh, so we're going to jump down a little further. But let's talk about his power first. When Jesus makes the choice to move, his power is shown as immediate. His power is in response to his compassion. His compassion is in response to his knowledge. And we know that it is all infinite. So what we find here is a man that has been paralyzed for 38 years, a man that is so paralyzed that he can't move himself quick enough to experience the, the, the healing that the pool can provide. No man can help him. He can't help himself. And so we have a situation that, that, that shows that no matter how long he's been in the situation, no matter how bad the situation is, God's power is able to restore it upon our own confession of our own helplessness. You see, it wasn't the, the, the pool couldn't do the job for him. The man couldn't do the job for him. He couldn't do the job for himself. But at the moment of a confession of helplessness, Jesus was able, he was able to immediately respond by getting him to confess his helplessness with a question. Would you be made well? And because of that, because of Jesus' knowledge, because of Jesus' compassion, because of Jesus' power, all because of a question, do you want to be made well? Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be set free? Do you want to be saved? Because our salvation is produced by a confession of our own helplessness. His power responds immediately. Now, I hope you don't think this is a message about healing. This is not just a message about healing. If we jump down to John 5, 13 and 14, it says, but the one who was healed did not know who it was for Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. What I find beautiful about this story is Jesus found the man twice. The man didn't find Jesus. He found the man at the pool. Then he found the man at the temple. He found the man at the pool and healed before he healed him. Then he found the man at the temple after he healed him. Let me tell you something. We don't find Jesus. Jesus finds us. The man didn't seek out Jesus the first time because he didn't know who Jesus was. And he didn't seek out Jesus the second time. He didn't know where he was. 
And so Jesus always knows how to find us and where to find us. And in those moments is when he can heal us and when he can deliver us. Jesus seeks us out. And the purpose of the healing is not for healing's sake. When we read all about Jesus' uh, uh, healing and miracles, it is not just for the sake of uh, conducting healing and miracles. It is to show the extension of his grace to draw men upon to himself. So Jesus did not heal the man for healing's sake. He, he healed the man for holiness' sake because his command to him after he found him was sin no more lest you find yourself in a worse condition. See, Jesus doesn't just save us from the penalty of sin. He saves us from the power of sin. He doesn't save us just so that we can escape hell. He saves us so that we can experience heaven. Jesus' healing is not for healing's sake. God's provision is not for provision's sake. It's not so that we can seek the healing, but we can seek the healer. I came across a, a video of a young man who was paralyzed in a car accident, and um, he's still paralyzed to this day. And he talked about how he came to found Je came to find Jesus, and he started out seeking Jesus so that he could be healed, and began to get frustrated because he was not being healed. And then he realized, I'm seeking the wrong thing. I'm seeking the healer. I'm seeking the healing, not the healer. I'm seeking the thing, I'm seeking the created thing, not the creator. Uh, I, I, I'm seeking an experience, but not the God. And so what we must understand is that God is not coming to us to, to heal us for healing's sake. He's not coming to provide to us for provision's sake. He's doing that so that we can get to know him for his own sake. Jesus' question for us then is not, not for us to be healed, not do we want healing, but are we aware that we are incapable in and of ourselves to be restored spiritually, emotionally, and physically, and therefore we need him. Jesus asks us questions not to expose what he doesn't know. He asks us questions to expose what we don't know, to expose what we don't have, to expose what we can't do. Jesus asked this question so that we can face the reality of the fact that we are helpless and are in need of a healer, are in need of a provider, are in need of a savior, are in need of he himself who can do all things, who have all knowledge, all compassion, and all power to produce the healing in us from the inside out. And in this way, our healing should lead holiness. Our healing should lead to holiness. The doors of the church are open. Mm -hmm.